Chapter 1, Thinking Critically with Psychological Science. This PowerPoint will cover your textbook pages 19 through 26. One of the first things psychologists have come to understand are the limits of intuition and common sense. How can we separate uninformed opinions from examined conclusions? How can we best use psychology to understand why people think, feel, and act as they do? We know that our gut sometimes tells us one thing, but what we really have found throughout research is that it needs to be tested, and what oftentimes seems to be common sense actually isn't. So our first learning target is to take a look at describing one of your vocab words called hindsight bias, and explain how sometimes it can make research findings seem like mere common sense. So hindsight bias is oftentimes referred to as the I knew it all along phenomenon. Oftentimes what we see is that we have a tendency to believe after learning an outcome that we would have foreseen it, that we would have predicted that that would have happened. Oftentimes though we know that it's only because we view our past as, you know, like hindsight being 2020 vision. So we're going to do a few activities that will demonstrate this phenomenon. After the horror of 9-11, it seemed very obvious that the United States intelligence analysts should have taken advanced warnings more seriously, that airport security should have anticipated the box cutter terrorists, that occupants of the second World Trade Center tower should have known to play it safe and leave. With 2020 hindsight, oftentimes everything seems obvious. Thus now we spend billions of dollars to protect ourselves against what the terrorists did last time. Sometimes I find that to be true when I make tests with multiple choice questions and the test generator gives me the answer and it just seems like a really obvious question to me. But then when students take the test and they suggest a different answer, I oftentimes will see how more than one answer could likely be the, the right answer. Brain teasers oftentimes are this way for me as well. I, I see the brain teaser, I see what the answer is, and then I'm like, oh yeah, duh. But if I were to have not seen the answer, I probably would have struggled with it a lot longer. Here are some famous quotes that demonstrate hindsight bias. Anything seems commonplace once explained, Dr. Watson to Sherlock Holmes. History is written through a rearview mirror, but it unfolds through a foggy windshield. Life is lived forwards, but understood backwards. So these are just some examples of hindsight bias. When you see this slide, you'll notice that there are eight true or false questions. If you've taken this because you've done your reading, or maybe plan to take it, you'll actually find out that what seems to be the likely common sense answer is actually not the case. Our second learning target describes how overconfidence can contaminate our everyday judgments. Overconfidence is simply defined as, well, actually that's not a definition, it's just a statement. So it basically is giving your learning target once again at the top. These are just kind of funny examples of overconfidence. They couldn't hit an elephant at this dis... Ooh, that was General John Sedgwick's last words uttered during a Civil War battle in 1864. We don't like the sound. Groups of guitars are on their way out. This is Decca Records and turning down a recording contract with the Beatles in 1962. Ouch, big mistake. So as humans, we have a tendency to be overly confident and we oftentimes think we know more than we do. Science with its procedures for gathering and sifting evidence restrains errors by taking us beyond the limits of our intuition and our common sense. So learning target three really explains how the scientific attitude encourages us to be critical thinkers. 
The scientific approach helps us sift reality from illusion. It puts ideas, even crazy sounding ideas, to the test. It helps us separate sense from nonsense. The scientific attitude prepares us to use critical thinking, and that's thinking that does not blindly accept arguments and conclusions. Rather, it examines assumptions, it discerns hidden values, it evaluates evidence, and it assesses conclusions. Learning Target 4 describes how the psychological theories that we use have guided scientific research. Here it is, folks, the scientific method. You learned about it early on in elementary school. You've seen it again and again in your science classes. What you want to understand is that the scientific method is something that psychologists use in their research as well. All of the theories and research that we will talk about throughout the year have been based on the scientific method using empirical research practices. For example, you can see how this can apply to psychology. The theory, for example here, is that lowest self-esteem feeds depression. So you can see in this illustration, low self-esteem leads to the hypothesis that people with low self-esteem score higher on a depression scale. If they were to go to a psychologist and take an inventory, some kind of test that would indicate a score on the depression scale. And then, using the scientific method, you can see how research and op observations make this conclusion. They administer tests of self-esteem and depression, and they want to see if a low score on one might predict a high score on the other. Then they generate or refine the research, and they find that either their hypothesis is supported by those who participated in the study, or in fact, that there isn't a link between low self-esteem and depression. The last slide in this PowerPoint goes over some of your important vocab words. Theory and hypothesis, those are two words that you have seen again and again in research. A theory is an explanation using integrated sets of principles that organizes and predicts observations. A hypothesis in psychological terms is a testable prediction and it's often implied by a theory. Operational definitions are very important in research. It's a statement of the procedures used to define research variables. When we talk about experiments in particular, when psychologists conduct experiments, they need to identify the independent and dependent variable. And the only way that we can guarantee solid results is by operationally defining the variable. So for example, if my hypothesis is that watching violent programs will lead to aggressive behavior, I need to operationally define what a violent program is. I need a statement that clearly defines a violent program. And then I also need to be able to define what is aggressive behavior. So an operational definition would clearly lay out to anyone replicating my experiment what to look for with aggressive behavior. We know that you can't just conduct one experiment and be done with it. You have to replicate your experiments in order for it to be a valid research design. So replication is simply repeating the essence of a research study, usually with different situations, to see whether the basic findings extend to other participants and circumstances. That's why operational definitions are very important in the replication process. That concludes today's PowerPoint from pages 19 to 26.